Good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started with this session as we get ready to close out this fabulous conference. My name is Diane Balkin. I am a contract attorney with the Animal Legal Defense Fund Criminal Justice Program. I work remotely from Denver. I love what I do. We assist people nationwide on any crime against an animal. I'm pleased today to be moderating the panel on the issue of the police shot my dog. It's particularly significant for me having come from Colorado because I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that at the last legislative session, Colorado enacted the Dog Protection Act. It's the first uh, law of its kind in the country. And it was born out of a number of dog shootings in Colorado where the police fatally shot several dogs. The most noteworthy was Chloe, a pit bull mix who was shot in Commerce City, Colorado uh, by an officer while the dog was restrained on a catch pole uh, being held by an animal control officer. That officer uh, faces administrative sanctions, but he was also charged with the felony animal cruelty for shooting the dog. And with, uh, what's interesting about it is that he was charged criminally and held accountable, but I must add that two weeks ago he was found not guilty by a jury. But um, the district attorney and the investigators did a good job putting the case together, but it's just showing the trend in the community's awareness of this issue. I have included a copy of the Dog Protection Act in your speaker materials, and we've provided a number of very valuable materials on this topic uh, for your further review. The new law makes it mandatory for every law enforcement officer in Colorado to receive three hours of training in encounters with dogs to make them better able to deal with these encounters and using less, less than lethal force. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the panel members that you will hear from today. We are pleased to have with us Karen Snell, who's a civil rights attorney who lives nearby. She's an alumni of Stanford undergraduate and law school. And Karen is a constitutional litigator focusing on civil rights and federal criminal defense. She has successfully sued for damages under federal civil rights act on behalf of dog owners whose pets were shot and killed by police officers and she will talk to you in particular about those cases. We also have with us today Captain Scott Sargent. He's a captain with the LAPD. He spent some time with several police departments. He happens to also be a lawyer. He's the commanding officer for the Use of Force Review Division of the LAPD, and he oversees the investigations of all officer-involved shootings, including shootings of <coughs> dogs and animals. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you. I'm very happy that my alma mater is sponsoring this, con this uh, conference, and I'm honored to be invited to speak here. In the late 1990s, a man named Steve Tawson was working as a bouncer at a strip club in an unincorporated area of San Jose, ironically called the Pink Poodle. This one night, he was called into work because a drunk man was harassing uh, the dancers. And he came in, oh, and I forgot to add, he was also a member of the San Jose Charter of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. So this one night, he was called in to work uh, to handle this drunk man. And he walked up to him, and the guy took a swing at Steve, and Steve punched him, and the guy fell down and died. And there's a certain, um, maybe you could say, hatred between the uh, law enforcement and the Hells Angels in the San Jose <clears throat> area. And Steve ended up being charged with first-degree murder uh, with special circumstances. And he was arrested, and uh, an investigation by the, by the uh, sheriff's department and the police turned up the fact that there was a security camera in the bar or strip club that they um, thought might show what had actually occurred. And they came up with this theory that the Hells Angels had gotten the videotape and were using a shell game and passing it between one another. 
And uh, so uh, they got a warrant to search the homes of all of the members of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club for one videotape. Now, for those of us who know our criminal procedure, it's hard to imagine probable cause to search for one thing in more than 15 places, but they got their warrant. So they also got a warrant to search for indicia of membership in the Hells Angels, because in the event that Steve was convicted, he could have gotten a three-year sentencing enhancement if they proved he was part of a criminal street gang. Now, he was facing life in prison without parole, so that seemed a little ridiculous, but nevertheless, the judge signed the warrant. So uh, one day, um, the, on one morning, at approximately 7 in the morning, uh, units from the San Jose Police Department and the San, Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department uh, raided the homes of 11 Hells Angels and Friends of Hells Angels in the San Jose area, as well as the clubhouse. And uh, they uh, had entry teams, and they'd had, a, they'd had weeks to plan for this, but at least one week after the warrant was signed to plan for this. And they knew that at two of the homes, the people had dogs. One of them had a sign on their fence. The others, they could see the dogs, which the police described as guard dogs, through the fence. When they went to the, the house with the fence, uh, they, uh, there was one officer who was assigned to deal with the dogs. And um, his, he said he came up with a little plan. And his plan consisted of poking the dog through the fence with his rifle, and if it didn't run away, shooting it. And that's what they did. They, uh, they, 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 this wasn't a no-knock warrant. They had to knock on the front door, but they figured they'd go in through the gate and then knock on the front door. And of course, they knew the dogs would be there. And their reason for not alerting the, uh, the householders to the fact that they were there outside the gate is they wanted to maintain the element of surprise. Well, of course, if you're going to shoot a rifle, you've lost the element of surprise. At another home, uh, the, the fellow that lived there was not a member of the Hells Angels, but was a friend of a member. And he had a Rottweiler. And he was out of town, but his neighbor, with whom he shared his backyard, was home. And when the police came up, she said, may I, may I help you? May I get the dog? And they said, no. And they cut the locks on the gate, but they weren't able to get in that way. So they went in through the house and basically stalked the dog. And when they saw it, they shot it. And the neighbor witnessed the whole thing. She was an elderly woman. So at the time that this occurred, um, my, meanwhile, none of these folks were uh, accused or um, considered suspects of any crime. They were just members who the police thought might have this videotape and, of course, indicia of Hells Angels. And I should add that in, in terms of the indicia, when you're a Hells Angel, pretty much everything you own is indicia of Hells Angels. Your photo albums, your clothing, your, your jewelry, your wall plaques, your clocks, everything, and they, your motorcycles. They cleared it all out. They had to rent storage space for this indicia that was just one element of proving up or attempting to prove up that the uh, Hells Angels were a criminal street gang for this three-year sentencing enhancement. So this happens. Um, Steve Tossin goes on trial, and the club as a whole uh, comes to see me. And at that time, I, I was um, working as a, I was in a small law firm. I was a partner in a small law firm. And we did primarily federal criminal defense, but we branched into doing uh, plaintiff civil rights work as well. And the Plaintiff's Civil Rights Act, uh, known as Section 1983, is um, 42 United States Code, Section 90, 1983, reads as follows. Every person who, under color of any state law, subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law. Now, in, in my case, uh, we specialize in police misconduct cases. And that generally falls under the Fourth Amendment, that being the constitutional right 
that we, uh, that we believe our clients have had violated by the police and that we sue under under Section 1983. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. But I'll, I'll read um, just parts of it now because it, it pertains to this case in an unusual way. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, upon, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, what I found early on in this case, which was a surprise to me, uh, there was no question that dogs are effects within the law. What was a question was whether killing a dog is seizing it, because you're not taking it away. And we actually had to fight that battle, but we won that battle eventually. Um, and this is an important thing for any of you who may think of doing these cases, um, either with your firm or, or whatever. Uh, there is a provision for attorney's fees if you uh, prevail in a Section 1983 case. And you get the prevailing rate for your level um, in your community. So it's not, you're not limited to, you know, a CJA um, type of rate. You can get, you know, whatever you would get if you were, if you were doing this as a, a private person. Problem is you don't get paid until you prevail. And if, for example, in this case, it took eight years. <laughs> so, so um, and this is the way the, the courts have interpreted Section 1988 is that fees are to be awarded in the ordinary case to the prevailing plaintiff. And prevailing defendants may only obtain fees if the litigation is deemed frivolous. So it's really not a threat if you've got a solid case. And as a, as a plaintiff's lawyer, unlike a criminal defense lawyer, you get to pick your cases, pick your facts, and you try and pick ones that you've got a chance at. Now, this was my client, my group of clients. So they came to see me. <laughs> and uh, I was actually invited to go to the clubhouse for a meeting, which all my friends who, who had represented Hells Angels in criminal cases said was really quite rare. And uh, they had late, I'm just going to an aside for a moment, they'd laid out plates of crudite. And I was like really in, you know, intent on being professional and showing them that I was going to be efficient. And my associates said, you know, I don't think they have these crudite every day. <laughs> <laughs> so as it turned out, you know, we had a, a nice, long, and, and very good uh, working relationship. But when you would tell people you were representing the Hells Angels, they go, ew. And when you tell them, but they shot their dogs, they go, oh, that's terrible. You know, and it really, it took a long time. But, you know, over the years, I think that the city of San Jose came to think, oh, that's terrible. Um, but in any event, so our task uh, working within the context of the Fourth Amendment was to analyze the warrant. and. Um, the first thing is, if the police have a warrant, you've got to look to look at whether it was it was valid, and if it was not based on probable cause to believe evidence of a crime would be found or was overbroad, then the search and seizure are unlawful. In this case, the judge found that there uh, was no probable cause to search for one thing in 15 places, um, even though probable doesn't mean more than 50 percent, as you would think. It, it doesn't. It's just some amorphous thing. But 15 places for one thing was too much. But with respect to the indicia, the judge did find that they had a right to go into the homes to search for the indicia. However, he found, and this is the lower court judge, uh, that um, seizing so many things just to show that the Hells Angels had a common um, the sign or symbol was ridiculous. And so he ruled that that was improper. But nevertheless, it got them into the house, and we hadn't won uh, our point at that level. But even where a warrant was valid, and so the, the entry is valid, if it was executed in an unreasonable manner, that's considered a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And uh, the, the law on that is, uh, stems from Graham v. Connor. 
um, a very important Supreme Court case from 1989, which says that in looking at whether police conduct is reasonable, you balance the nature and quality of the intrusion on the individual's Fourth Amendment interests against the countervailing governmental interests at stake. And so in this case, the court found that the intrusion was severe. Uh, that dogs are more than a personal effect. The emotional attachment to a family's dog is not comparable to a possessory interest in furniture. That seems so self-evident, but having it in writing in an appellate court decision turned out to be a really big deal, and this has is, this is actually proved to be a very important precedent. Um, in this case, Having found the intrusion was severe, the courts had to look at the governmental interest at stake. And here, the, uh, the city and the county argued that the law enforcement interest in seeking evidence of murder was, was great. But the court pointed out that none of these plaintiffs were suspected of murder or anything else, and there was no probable cause to search for one video and meeting notes in 11 different locations. Then the, the officers argued, well, the governmental interest was the need for stealth and speed. But again, how can that interest truly really be your purpose when you're willing to shoot a shotgun and kill a dog? And finally, the issue of the safety of the officers. Um, the courts found that, and this was a part they very much emphasized, that the officers knew about the dogs and had substantial time to develop strategies for, for immobilizing them. <coughs> Now, in that case, as I mentioned, the um, officer's plan for dealing with the dogs was to isolate or shoot them, and they had no specific plan for isolating the dogs. Um, the plan consisted of first hoping the dogs would not appear. If they did appear, to poke them with the shotgun and try to scare them if that did not work to engage the dogs or to shoot them. And the Ninth Circuit concluded that that was unnecessary. <clears throat> that uh, the officers violated the plaintiff's rights because they had a week to plan and they should have done something more than they did. Saussure versus Katz is the important uh, Supreme Court case that plaintiff's lawyers hate um, that says that even if you show a constitutional violation, you also have to show that it was well established and that a reasonable officer would have known about it at the time of the incident. In our case, we argued that Fuller versus Vines, an earlier Ninth Circuit case, uh, had, had, well established, had established a dog as an effect and the killing of a dog as a seizure. And although the um, defendants tried to distinguish that case because it had been a warrantless um, incident, the court held that it did uh, establish sufficiently the right. So as a result of, of our victory in the Ninth Circuit, and I might add, we didn't ever get before a jury because what happened was the um, Ninth Circuit uh, was ruling simply on whether the, the right was well established and the officers should have the case dismissed at that point. When they said it was and that we could go to trial, we ended up settling the case. And as a result of that settlement, uh, which worked out to about $2 million, um, near a million each from the city and the county, uh, a model jury instruction has been formed. And I know that this has been used uh, by other plaintiffs. And hopefully, there are going to be many, many more cases until until Scott's view prevails and uh, there's, we stop shooting dogs unnecessarily in our society. Now, the holding of the Hells Angels case was limited to cases in which uh, they have time to plan. They know there's a dog and can do something about it. And they distinguish cases where there's an unexpected situation where officers are confronted with exigent circumstances. So the next case that came to me involved just that, um, Cynthia Peters versus the city of Richmond. Now, Richmond is the city that ha was sued and lost in the Fuller versus Vines case some time earlier, but they didn't learn their lesson, and they shot a Miss Peters dog when they were allegedly chasing a suspect and claimed it went into apartment in her 
complex and opened the uh, gate to her backyard. And when her dog came out it, as they stood there, they shot the dog. And in that case, the, we had to argue about exigent circumstances. So again, it's back to your criminal procedure knowledge and, and uh, what is lawful and unlawful in terms of search and seizure. And in that case, we ended up uh, with $210,000 for the shooting of her dog. So that, that at least served as some deterrent, and they do have training there. Um, as I mentioned, San Jose paid uh, 800000 for just for the dogs, $2 million for the overall case. And hopefully that's had some in impact there. And I think just the fact that it was the Hells Angels that won that case really spread the word perhaps more <laughs> than it would have imagined if that had just been a regular family, how irritated people would have been at that verdict. And that's all I have, and I'll look forward to your questions. And I, before you move on, a couple of questions. Upon what was the damages based? Because we talk a lot about non-economic damages and the value of dogs. How were you able to get such a sizable award? Well, um, that's an excellent question. So in Fuller versus Vines, the 1994 case, that went to the jury. And the jury, it, that, in, that case involved a Great Dane, an elderly Great Dane, who was in its own front yard. And the officer came upon it um, unexpectedly, and it freaked him out, and he shot it. And they had to fight it all the way up to the Ninth Circuit uh, to establish the law. This was before the Saucier case, so they didn't have to worry about the well-established part. And then it went to a jury, and a jury awarded the family $250,000 for the dog. So we used that as a benchmark. Um, these cases also are partly driven by the attorney's fees because the, they know that if you go to trial, your fees are going to be pretty much double what they are at the time you're at the settlement conference. And so you, you sort of balance that. So I think uh, you know the, the Peters case settled early, and they got a bargain, if you ask me. But um, in the Hells Angels case, that was the... the measure we used, and it was persuasive to the other side. Good afternoon. I come in peace. I'm a fellow lawyer. <laughs> I wear a suit, not a uniform. A box of bottles. I just came from a, uh, a conference in Philadelphia of police chiefs, and if I started with uh, I'm a lawyer, it wouldn't have gone, I would have gotten the same. <laughs> um, I'm from LAPD, and uh, really what um, I'd like to base my um, presentation on is what we believe we're a part of in the law enforcement community of developing best practices. When we talk about best practices in policing, it's those that set, essentially set the trend for law enforcement on any particular issue. Um, and I, we like to think, or I like to think that what we do is setting a, setting a trend uh, nationally, which we, tend, we, we do tend, whether it's good or bad. Uh, agencies across the country tend to take what we do and kind of model their policies and, and procedures a, after what we do. Um, we understand in a lot of different uh, contexts, the issue, issues involved in animal-involved shootings. We refer to them as animal-involved because essentially we, um, you know, because uh, LA is 450 square miles, we do deal with a lot of different types of animals. Um, we have seen a relatively consistent pattern relatively for animal-involved shootings. We have had, this is kind of a general, uh, general numbers for total animals. Uh, for dogs, we had a spike. We had a spike in all officer-involved shootings in 2011. It was a very inordinate uh, big spike, and then it kind of started to settle down. Uh, but for the most part, we have a fairly uh, consistent uh, numbers of officer-involved shootings involving animals. One of the reasons we like to think is that we shoot dogs when there is no option, and I'll go into the details of our uh, training and our protocols. Um, uh, officers do have a right to defend themselves when they're uh, taking action. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can use unre unreasonable force in doing that. This is uh, our, our policy. Our policy is based on Graham versus Connor, which essentially defines uh, lethal force uh, for the courts and now law enforcement. 
Graham versus Connor is based on objective, an objective reasonable test, and it creates a uniform standard nationwide for using force, all force. Those agencies that are not using Graham versus Connor use uh, terms in their language like necessary, uh, last resort, which are not true measures uh, based on, on the, the court's decision. It's a subjective term of when you should have done something or should not have done something. Whereas Graham uh, has created this standard of object, objective reasonableness that we can all um, essentially uh, tr um, work through in adjudicating force, which is what I do for a living. So officers are, are authorized to use force to protect themselves or others for what's reasonably believed to be an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. And essentially where um, a dog, regardless of the breed, uh, attacks uh, a police officer, it's, it's clearly a risk of serious bodily injury. And that's when, that is when officers are authorized to use deadly force. Now that's, it's, it's our, what the, the real issue is what could they have done prior to having that contact to have prevented that from occurring? That's really essentially what, what the question is. So these are our um, protocols. These, this is what I use for the past six and a half years. Uh, just real quickly, uh, background. Um, every use of force in the police department comes to me. And by me, I mean my shop. I have a very small shop, two sides. One is a le less critical force. One is officer involved shootings and other, other types of uh, force and in custody deaths. We spend a lot of energy um, analyzing these shootings. We do not parse over them, determine whether the force is in policy and move on. Most of our time is spent on the middle one, tactics. Drawing and exhibiting, if you have an individual with a gun or a threat of uh, serious bodily injury or death, the uh, drawing and exhibiting is for the most part kind of a, a presumed thing based on historical standards. Tactics is where we spend our energy. And for animal shootings, did they have, did they um, appropriately use pre-shooting conduct and tactics that could have prevented the shooting, um, which uh, did it cause the shooting to occur, their conduct? Uh, those are the types of things that we look at. Just talking about real quick the, um, the case, the, the Hells Angels case, we would have spent a lot of energy analyzing the pre-shooting conduct, the, tac the tactical plan. Tactical planning for LAPD is everything. We'll do either an approval for tactics or an administrative disapproval, which can have consequences all the way up to and, and uh, uh, through a termination, uh, like a documentation all the way through termination. Or there's approved, which means it's consistent with the department standards and training. In that case, when I heard the term, which uh, sounds like it's a, a, a well-grounded term for the court or for the, for the attorney, a little plan. If we had had a little plan on, multiple in, on, a, on a multiple location search warrant uh, related to a homicide, we would pretty much, after ensuring we have the facts, default to an administrative disapproval. You don't do massive um, warrants of any kind, significant warrants. We don't do any warrants, uh, entries, other than exigent entries without significant planning. We don't do them with sufficient personnel. If we do and there's uh, uh, undue risk, unreasonable risk to the officers, that's an administrative disapproval. We do not approve that. If, if several officers surround a location, there's narcotics inside, they plan an entry, they go in and, and make an entry without any kind of... Uh, communication with the supervisor, uh, without the right probable cause, without really knowing what they have or having a plan, administrative disapproval. Doing a multi-location search warrant on, on any, any uh, uh, criminal syndicate, if you will, um, whether it be uh, Rolling Sixties or the Hells Angels, without a comprehensive plan, which would include every agency involved in a room like this, about the number of people that, the, that are in this room, a PowerPoint, full comprehension of what everybody's plan is. And on the form, the, the, the form we use is like a basic form. <clears throat> we have a checkbox, guns, yes or no, how do we know? Photographs of the locations and the entry points, things that we search critical to a warrant service. Dogs, animals, yes or no. And if there is prior knowledge of a dog being there, whether it's a pit bull type, and we don't use pit bull, we use the standard breed. Uh, we try to just kind of create some kind of a a standard uh, description so we have something to look back data, uh, data wise. Regardless of what the read is, we have a plan. 
Officer A, B, C, and D, you'll have either a catch pole or you'll be uh, uh, with the two officers in the front that are from animal control. They have the proper equipment to do it, uh, to take the dog into custody. You have a fire extinguisher. We always take a fire extinguisher to a location where we think there is a dog. It's the first line of, essentially first line of defense for us. Taser, if that's an opportunity, and OC spray, which can work in a, uh, for a dog, in a dog's eyes. That's essentially a best practice for us to ensure that we're doing it, we're, we're doing everything we can to prevent the use of force. Essentially, it causes us more, it just on a, on a side note, it causes us a lot of problems and delay in making an entry when we have to deal with an officer involved shooting of any kind, uh, especially of an animal in the front yard while getting into the location. It's far more advantageous for us to, in a tactical note, to try to resolve that um, up front. On a regular call where we see an owner, again, just to kind of um, touch on, on points made, who says, can I get the dog? Unless there's some kind of a reason we don't want that person into harm's way, like an active shooter uh, situation, we'll generally allow the person to take the dog. Um, why not? That's really the, the bottom line is, is why wouldn't we do that? We're trained to do what we can to solve the problem instead of causing deadly force. It's just con it's common sense. It is Graham versus Connor. It's what's reasonable for a police officer to do. It's what we push down as, as training. These are things that you're, that you're well aware of. We have what's called a training tactics directive that we put out on uh, per foot pursuits, vehicle pursuits, uh, a whole number of things, which is available on our website, lapdonline.com. Most of that stuff is on there. Um, or I can get any of those uh, things to you. And one of them is animal contacts. And the animal contacts one gives you what you already know are going to be the, the, the things that should be on there. And it's a training document for police, which is reinforced through an online training protocol for the department. We have a LAN that's department-wide. Officers log on to training. They have a series of trainings that they have to go through, including a new foot pursuit directive, new guidelines. They'll go through that new pursuit, vehicle pursuit guidelines, they have to go through the online course, animal contacts, dog shootings, they have to go through the course, which is a very simple, uh, effective way to ensure that everyone uh, has opportunity to go through training. <clears throat> Our directives are living, breathing documents. What we found in the past is police departments will uh, have uh, guidelines and policies that are old. This is a, uh, one that we constantly are updating. So the beware of dog signs, a lot of these you already know, bowls, dishes um, of any kind, dog house, uh, path. You see the path run in the dirt. A lot of the locations you can clearly see that there's, there's a dog living there. Um, you should be able to know. So the officers are, are, are supposed to find out whether there's a dog there. Use every reasonable means to find out whether there's a dog present. You essentially rattle the, the, the gate. The vast majority of times, the dog will, appear, will, make, will make itself known. And from there, you create a plan. You come up with a plan to contain it, uh, take it into custody as best you can. Our officer-involved shootings are usually where we're in a, a pursuit into the yard of a suspect, and as you're going through the yard, the threat poses itself. Or we check to make sure the dog's not there, there's absolutely no sign of it, and we go in, and it's either inside the house or underneath the porch. That's occurred. Um, we've had, we've had recently had a, a person sick the dog on us, uh, where the dog was inside the house, quiet, made the approach, saw the dog. You need to secure the dog. Why? Because we're coming in the house. We have a warrant. Uh, you need to secure the dog. So, um, she, the, the individual came back and said, yeah, I secured the dog. The officer opened it. The dog came charging, had been held back and then released was what came charging to the front door to the officers. It was an intentional use of the dog as an, as an assaulted weapon. And that occasionally you'll do. I've had that where the, the uh, person who didn't want me to come in their car took a German Shepherd out and said, come another step. And the dog was, was going off, essentially going off on me and was using it as an event, effective uh, as a weapon, which rarely occurs, but those are sometimes things that, that do happen. As a side note, I was a canine handler. For four years, I developed a bond with an animal as a partner, uh, which uh, was something that no owner of an animal, of a dog, can really comprehend. He was my partner. Not only do I understand the, the, the uh, emotional issues uh, with dog shootings, um, I think that the Hells Angels case, the case itself, not the facts, is good. Now, 
I'll be hated for saying that, so let's keep it in this room. <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that force, to, uh, force people to, to make, uh, ch make change. That's just the way our, our system works, and essentially it'll eventually get pushed down. It's the way the McPherson case and Taser in California changed the way we use Taser. Uh, it's how we're going to perceive the process for, for dog shootings. And because our directives and policies are living, those are the types of things that will be considered. Even though we're setting the standard with our directive and ours would not have occurred, that's kind of a key thing for us is we don't want a Hells Angels case in, in Los Angeles. So we go far out of our way to ensure that we're, we're ahead of the curve on that. So these are some of the signs that most of you know, the hackles, the ear posture tail. They're very, it's very simple. Being a handler, I can, you know, or most of you that have um, contact with animals have dogs. You know what it looks like when he's not happy. Um, either you haven't fed him, um, or you just know when, it's, when the dog is, uh, is hostile. So these are essentially some of the things that we require uh, of officers. Not require, but we look at an objectively reasonable uh, stance of not just the force, but the tactics. So uh, we look at what things they could have done. We don't Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback, which is uh, a uh, Graham versus Connor uh, thing, but we do look at what they did, and we do look essentially as a tactic what they could have done to prevent the shooting. That's my job. All the shootings come through me. My staff does the work, and then they come, uh, come to me. Very easily, we have administrative disapproval for a dog shooting. I personally won't hesitate to do it and overturn what my staff believes because of the personal feelings I have towards the animals. And I've seen organizations where there are no rules, none. They're out. Some of them are not in, this, uh, in, the, in the local region, Southern California. They're way out where there aren't a lot of rules. The further east you go, generally, that's kind of, don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> we all have rules and strict policies. But they're essentially are places where you reload your weapon and go back to work and call uh, whomever it is to come out and deal with the, uh, with the aftermath of a, of a dog shooting. Um, we don't do that. We're absolutely forbidden to, for, for just arbitrarily using force. Um, we see the, uh, what can come of it. You can be uh, prosecuted. You can, you're civilly liable. And the organization, our organization, uh, would not stand for it. So these are some of the things we expect officers to do or to attempt. OC spray is not, not necessarily very effective. On a moving dog, it's difficult to target a dog. I'm just telling you the facts. It's difficult to target the animal. Taser is virtually impossible. First reaction, well, you should have used a taser. Well, easier said than done. You carry it, off, you carry it offside on, uh, and you're, you're to draw it either way, depending on how you're trained. By firing, there's a dart spread immediately that is very difficult to actually get the dog. Uh, by the time you're, you're firing it, the dog's usually already on the officer um, and causing, causing injury. Kick him. That's really what I would prefer to see officers do. If you have to be prepared to use lethal force, that's okay, but you should try to at least kick, uh, kick the dog. Uh, and sometimes that'll do it. Sometimes the dog will run away. Baton is another great tool. Uh, fire extinguishers are required. If you know, if you're, you, you know that there's a dog there. So as you're going forward, if you know there's an, a, a dog, fire extinguishers are the best tool. You just simply blast the animal, and it usually arr, 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 will run away. And uh, it's just a, a psychological um, deterrent. Beanbag shotgun. If you know the dog's there, you have to make entry into that location. You see the dog posing a threat to that individual. You can fire the beanbag, and usually that'll work too. <clears throat> you don't do it on an, on an immediate basis, but if you know the dog's there and presenting a threat, uh, you can do that. <clears throat> so these are some of the things we just talked about. Size and speed can cause a problem. Um, every consideration for background, we always have that, where you're firing a fire, you're shooting a firearm, uh, period. You have to, you be, it has to be an objectively reasonable use of deadly force. If you're likely to hit the ground, cause ricochet and injury, which we do have, uh, you have, should, should have given every consideration to that occurring. And if you did not, tactically, you're administratively disapproved and you can get significant uh, discipline for, for that lack of planning. Uh, can't use uh, the, the firearm for protection of property. Uh, if he's preventing access to a car, destroying something, then uh, you're, obviously you can't do that. 
Um, I'm going to show you a video. There are a lot of videos out there. This is not a, um, all right, pause that. This is not a happy ending, but what I want to focus on is the amount of effort that the officers went to contain the dogs. <clears throat> These were a pack. There were, I think, a, initially four uh, and now uh, down to three um, Mastiff-type dogs that had gotten loose uh, from the owner's yard and were, had a, had a uh, violent history and were going down the street and attacking people. So understand that. This is not a group of dogs that were just wandering down the street and the police decided to corral it. There were numerous uh, calls uh, and facts to support that these dogs had bit several people. They are large dogs, you know Mastiffs, they're not small. Um, they have heads about this big, <laughs> <laughs> like a small truck. Um, they can be extremely friendly, or and obviously, like the all dogs, it depends on how they're raised and how they're treated. And, um, so anyway, these dogs were going down the street, and the police had a plan. The plan was to corral the dogs, take them into custody, and use catch poles to try to, 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 contain the, to contain them. One of them leapt forward and attacked one of the officers, in which case he had to use a shotgun and, and put that one down. The other one retreats under the car, which is a sad scene where you can see the dog under the car. But just the, the point of the video is to show you the efforts that the police went to to try to contain these dogs instead of just uh, running up and shooting them. Okay, uh, this is, was on video, so it was kind of because of the size of the dogs and interest. Um, in, this was a South LA case. Um, they made a, uh, this made it to YouTube and some other things, so they, the, the news went out and got the footage, which was actually really good footage. So essentially they got a call of uh, these dogs that had been attacking people going down the street. He's trying to say something, he's thinking. <laughs> This video shows they were riled up and roaming loose. When one okay. went after LAPD officers, they opened fire. Let's get it out. <laughs> the video okay. Is too graphic for so this is where the police encountered. You can see they're trying to contain. Go. They're trying to con contain these uh, these large animals between cars. So they use the cars to pin the dogs in and try to take them into custody without uh, using. Um, deadly force and at this point there's some force that just wouldn't wouldn't work if you use taser it wouldn't have any effect what's the point uh, OC spray what there's no point in it uh, this is not a direct attack it's to take these the dogs off the street before they they injure somebody animal control officers were able to round up the other two dogs and take them to a shelter good looking young very different than an attack by a single dog it quickly this went on for some time which is really the point is that there are police departments police officers that will put a lot of effort into ensuring that they do not have to shoot dogs who videotaped this uh, i was a citizen it was a cell phone tape, if I, if I remember correctly, and I think Channel 7 got there at some point. I think it's a mix of, mix of them. So they got one of them. They're trying to get, I think there were three at this point. So they're trying to get, uh, get the other one. Look at them. Hurting, they were hurting them. They literally were. They're trying to uh, uh, put them in one capture in one place and which is what they did they corralled them with the with the police cars well it depends on the circumstances taser like i explained usually if the dog's attacking the we, we don't want you, if you have deadly, a deadly force option, to be perfectly frank, we don't necessarily want you to use a taser. However, under those circumstances, it's a, it's a tool you could use. So if you have the dog running in circles, um, coming at you, snarling, not charging at you, you could use a taser. Would it be reasonable? Yes. Um, but the dart spread alone may not be effective. Also, it's not always effective because of the coat. Uh, because of just a, a lot of, I've seen a, a taser use uh, really well, and the dog just went right down. Um, dogs sometimes don't react to it, uh, or the dart, it's usually that the dart uh, will miss their mark. OC spray is great under some circumstances. Um, in this one, what would be the point of it? 
you're not deterring an attack. You're trying to take these dogs into custody. You, the taser would have no effect because you're trying to take them into custody. So, no, there we go. no, and then climb over into the other dogs. And no, this is the best tool here was to contain them and use the poles and take them one at a time. Three. I think it started it over. Oh, yeah, it okay. started. Let's see if I can take it right to the end. Um, anyway, as they were they were do, going through all these uh, these efforts to, to contain the dog, one of them lunged over the car, and the officer uh, shot it as it was coming over the car. Um, but for that, these guys did an outstanding job of trying to contain these dogs and try to take them uh, peacefully into custody. So to answer the OC question, there's no point of OCing this dog except it's going to make him more angry. Um, angry animals too; they don't really get necessarily affected. Their tear ducts um, are not uh, that. Um, uh, effective in the eyes, so uh, it creates temporary blindness, but um, is not that effective. Taser is a five-second jolt. There would be no, no, no reason to use it here because you have to be able to put the dog down and then try to con uh, contain it. Um, it's great if you're trying to stop an attack. Um, that's where the real purpose is. Fire extinguisher wouldn't do anything. We don't want them running off. We want to contain them and take them into custody. Animal control was there. That was the plan. They were using the, the sticks to take them into, into uh, custody. And the other one, they took they took two. The first one you saw, the second one crawled under a car after the shooting. And then they were able to get, uh, get him and, and pull him out. So anyway, and the point is to, that there are um, efforts, whether they're extraordinary in your mind or not, uh, to, to do this. And um, there, there is not a widespread um, uh, emphasis for the police to, to be shooting dogs. It's just uh, sometimes there are no rules. Some sometimes you need um, rules to, to ensure that the training is done right. So hopefully we've got it right. There's a directive in your um, app or in your on the website where you can pull up. You can actually see our directive and how it's laid out. Uh, and it's numbered, so we change it uh, as needed. Um, so because of the Hells Angels case, we actually may update and put some other things in there. We have about seven minutes left okay. for questions, if anybody has questions. Yes, sir. I want to make sure we can hear you. Yes, yeah, Scott, I was uh, just uh, thinking that with 40% or more, depending on what statistics you want to use, 40% or more of the households in America have at least one or more dogs. And I'm wondering if, if you would recommend that this dog preparation policy, if I can call it that. And I know here we're discussing it in a Fourth Amendment situation, but uh, dogs are everywhere in society. Would you suggest that this become a part of uh, police protocol for all departments everywhere, that any time they can encounter a dog just by walking out of the station house? Well, if there's a plan, yes. I mean, the, the, the answer is that all officers should be trained. They should be trained in dog encounters. Rarely do we encounter uh, dogs that, are, that show aggressiveness towards the police. If they do, usually, and I know, usually if you raise your voice, stomp your foot, um, or pull out your baton, dogs aren't likely to attack you. If a police dog who's trained to attack is hesitant to attack a person, and they are because that's not the natural process for animals, they have a protective instincts, which is not to run towards something that would represent a a danger. If they won't attack, it's really not likely that, that a household dog is going to is going to attack. But if the dog does show those signs, police officers should be prepared and know what to do in those cases. And if they're able to retreat and secure the dog, that's what we expect them to do. And there are cases, we had one just recently where the uh, officers went into the house and there was a Rottweiler, big Rottweiler, and it was standing in the doorway barking in a back room. And the officers just said, can you please contain the dog? Dog wasn't attacking them. So they're not going to do anything. They're not going to shoot the dog. And he was standing in the doorway barking and even advancing a little, and they stomped their foot, and I think he backed up. And they just said, can you please secure the dog? We're used to dealing with dogs. I mean, especially in a large city. We're, we're used to it. And the woman took the dog and couldn't, can, couldn't contain it. So we went in. We secured one bedroom door and then opened up a bathroom door, which was in a Jack and Jill uh, uh thing that we then went in and made some noise and the, uh, to draw it into this room. The Rottweiler went into this room. We then went in and kind of pushed its butt or something. It was pretty extraordinary to read how it went. And then they locked that door and the door, dog was secure in a bathroom. So the only uh, place in the house they couldn't get to to search was the bathroom. 
but that was okay. So that was a good example of what we expect officers to do. Just so you know, too, in the Dog Protection Act legislation, it has built into it that if at all possible, allow the owner to get control of the dog. But it, of course, it doesn't apply to exigent circumstances or circumstances when someone would be in harm's way. Joyce. No, I, I, I really don't. I know that there are uh, there are rules out there and, and basic post guidelines for police departments. There are there are provisions, if I'm not mistaken, for handling uh, dog encounters or, or vicious animal attacks. So it's part it's part I'm I'm pretty sure of police academy training. If nothing else, basic training. Whether there's reinforcement through continuous training, that's really the key for us. Everything we do is a continuous training concept, foot pursuits, and where we see a problem, we do a lessons learned, we pull lessons learned out of it, that's my job, and ensure we disseminate that to officers. So they're all aware uh, of particular circumstances that occur and, and what, we, what we've learned from it. And we'll be making the Colorado training available. It's gonna be three hour training, very concentrated, but we'll make it available. Yes. So, I mean, I love my officers, you know, they are in my neighborhood, but speaking with them, um, and I think that this has become maybe more of an issue with community policing, which in and of itself is a great idea, but when you have officers coming out of communities where dogs don't have a positive connotation necessarily, especially, you know, areas like Compton, like the South Central area, um, I don't mean to stereotype any place, just have places in nicer areas as well, where you have these pockets, so they don't have a positive atmosphere with dogs, and then they're put back in these communities, or in similar communities, they don't know how to deal with them, and even though there's an online portion, there are these groups of officers that are in no way comfortable dealing with the situation, and when they're in it, I think you're much more likely to have these types of, you know, officer-involved shootings. Is there any thought maybe to Yes. My job is to identify, uh, part, part of it is uh, work history, which is employment history for the, for the individual. If they've been in prior shootings, we spend a lot of energy on those shootings. What was the outcome of the shooting? Out of policy? Oh. We put a little bit more effort into the areas of concern in the prior shooting in this one to make sure we don't have reoccurring themes. So yes, uh, we do. We, we ensure, and if that is an issue with, with uh, any kind of shooting or force, uh, regardless of whether it's a dog or any other shooting, then they get specialized training in that. And every, everybody gets what's called a debrief after an adjudication of a case by the police commission. They're the ultimate finders of, of uh, uh, fact on a determination whether it's an impulse shooting or not. To the issue of the neighborhood, well, what we see is quite simply where there is a larger population of dogs that are trained to be violent, to protect property for, uh, for gang members, uh, for drug houses, you're going to see uh, an, an increase in, in animal involved shootings. And that's just the nature of what we do for a living. There's a more concentration of those locations in certain regions of the city. They're not all in South LA, there's some in the valley, uh, in uh, the east side of LA. Um, but that's where we have to police and we have to make uh, uh, access and we have to chase people into yards. And so that's where you see it. Um, so that's really the answer to that, is that we don't see any weird trends with things. And officers, yes. Well, I see it all the time. Do we ignore it? Absolutely not. That's a huge trigger for us. If I don't identify it, then I've got to take it to the Chief Beck. And Chief Beck and his staff, if they, if I, if they find out about a trend of an officer that I didn't identify, woe on me. And I mean that. It wouldn't be good. So if I, Administrative then, disapproval. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and that's I great. Will. I think we have time for one more question. I just have a quick question. You put up that chart originally with the number of animals that were shot, and there was a separate category for pit bulls. And um, I wanted to 
ask you if you think that more pit bulls are shot just based on um, their breed and the myth that they are more violent. Good question. I'm glad you're, I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't think you'd be the only one to catch that. I did too, <laughs> she wasn't. Breed discrimination. I'm not an expert in breed discrimination. I won't take up a lot of time. The dogs we shoot, uh, general, generally the dogs that are trained are the ones you've either seen on TV or that we see routinely with the huge spike collar, and they do occur, it's not a cartoon, where the gangster is walking down the street with a chain. It's a sign of macho, and I mean a large linked chain, to show that they have a, a bad dog, and that if they encounter another dog, they're going to fight, and it also protects property, and, and there's a lot of multi-use for these dogs as tools, utility. So yes, that, that is generally is a higher number for us because those are the animals we, we um, encounter. We don't use the term pit bull, we use pit bull type because um, we had the last presentation, there was a picture of a pit bull and it was like a poodle. I go, well, that's not our concept of the pit bull. But um, anyway, so yes, there is, there is a larger uh, number, but we don't seek them out. I think we've run out of time and we're gonna have some closing comments. I don't know. Steve is going to give us some closing comments at the conclusion. Thank you all so much.